This week on The Communicators, a discussion on how federal regulations from the FCC and Congress affect local broadcasters. Our guest is Gerald Fritz of All Britain Communications. And joining us this week, Jer Jerry Fritz serves as the Vice President for Legal and Strategic Affairs for All Britain Communications. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. For those outside of the Washington, D.C. area, All Britain Communications, could you give a scope of our viewers of, of what that entails? We're a media company. We own uh, uh, ABC affiliated stations in about uh, seven markets, eight stations in seven markets, including here in Washington. We also here in Washington uh, own the 24-hour cable news channel, News Channel 8, and we just started a little bit over a year ago uh, Politico and Politico.com, which is the uh, uh, political uh, uh, reporting uh, infrastructure for uh, for all things related to Capitol Hill, the White House, the election, and so forth. And but you're the the start of the company who had its starts in broadcasting. It definitely had its starts in broadcasting. Uh, Joe Albritton uh, bought the company back in 1975 uh, in in an effort uh, um, primarily to save the Washington Star newspaper here in Washington. Uh, so you grew from broadcast to cable to newspaper. So with all those properties in in place, one of the things that you keep an eye on, I'm sure, is media consolidation. Last night, the Senate passed a resolution taking a look at this issue. Um, this was passed by Senator Dorgan. Encapsulate what it says and what does it mean for a broadcaster? Well, Pedro, I think it's probably more show than substance. Uh, this is a reaction to the FCC's very long attempt to modernize the ownership rules. Uh, recognized back in mm, 30 years ago, in 1975, the FCC said, geez, we have this concern about diversity. And then this is the days before uh, the advent of cable, the advent of satellite, the, certainly the advent of the Internet. But there was a, con uh, a concern that there was too much concentration of ownership of the media. So they passed these rules back in 1975 that essentially said, among other things, you couldn't own a newspaper and a broadcast station in the same market. Um, that uh, had the unintended consequences of uh, killing several newspapers. Uh, but then fast forward uh, to maybe the uh, end of the uh, 90s, early 2000s, Michael Powell, who was then chairman of the FCC, said, we need to do something to sort of modernize these rules and perhaps help some of the, uh, the, the, the newspapers, the failing newspapers out there. Uh, he uh, went forward with a set of rules that was overturned by uh, the Third Circuit up in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, as a result, the commission went back to try to do it again. This commission, uh, headed by Kevin Martin, came up with a very modest proposal, sort of a, a limited uh, uh, ability to have some co owned uh, stations in some of the largest markets, but uh, Senator Dorgan didn't like that, maybe clinging to the memory of perhaps how uh, media used to be in the old days. Uh, but my guess is that certainly it has to pass the House, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, legislation that was passed by the, this, uh, uh, by the Senate yesterday. And then uh, uh, from there it would have to get past the President, who's already indicated that he's going to veto it. This is a standalone piece of legislation, probably not going to be attached to anything else, although it could be. Uh, and then, even if it is passed, even if we do revert to the, the rules uh, as they were, it probably is uh, too little too late because I think the industries have pretty much gone past there. The, the demise of the newspaper industry uh, may be inexorable, even with uh, the, the small help uh, of the uh, uh, change in the multiple ownership. One of the rules. concerns that the senator has <laughs> on this resolution and others is that if there's a concentration of uh, what companies own what media, there is a limiting of amount of diversity, as it's known, as far as viewpoints and opinions. And you don't see any legitimacy in that? Well, the facts and the history show exactly the opposite. Let me take a, a good example. Here in Washington, D.C., there used to be two highly competitive newspapers, the Washington Post and the Washington Star. Now, the Washington Star was an afternoon daily. Uh, it was losing in 1975 a million dollars a month. That's a lot of money in 1975. Um, uh, Joe Alberton came in and says, I think I can turn this around. But I need the money from the television station to pump into the newspaper to keep it alive. He went to the FCC, and the FCC says, you know, we just passed this 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 newspaper broadcast cross ownership rule and we can't let you do it. We'll give you three years, but you gotta you, you have to sell this uh, one or the other. All Britain came up with a plan and he says, all right, look, I'll swap stations. I'll take a station out in the Midwest 
and the owner there will take a, a, the, a, the WJLA here in Washington. But I still need, they're, they're not equivalent markets, so I'm going to take some extra money. And he got non-voting, non-voting preferred stock in the company that, uh, that had this, that was going to buy this, uh, this station in, in Washington. And he was going to use the funds there to pump into the Washington Star. Well, the FCC says, eh, we think it's all right, but we're going to think about changing that rule too. And oh, by the way, All Britain, if we change it, we might make it retroactive to you. Well, who does a $100 million deal on the strength that the egg's going to be unscrambled? So he said no. He sold the newspaper, the locally owned newspaper, to Time Magazine out of New York, who within a year or so shut it down. So in the name of diversity, in the shadow of Congress, in the backyard of the FCC, we have a monopoly newspaper town. So the unintended consequences of this diversity-enhancing rule was exactly the opposite. Uh, one of the things that the, the senator and some others, including some separate groups who weigh in on this issue, is they said that even though the, the newspaper uh, broadcast cross-ownership only affects the 20 largest markets, others say there are loopholes in that would affect uh, other groups, even in the lower markets, to be consolidated. One of those groups is a group called Stop Big Media. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, they said this back in November. They said, under Martin's new plan, cross-ownership is presumed to be the public in the public interest as long as it takes place in the top 20 markets, but it doesn't prevent other mergers, potentially hundreds more, from taking place in smaller markets. In fact, such waiver requests will almost be certainly granted under the loose and vague language of Martin's plan. How do you respond to that? Well, they wanted it sort of both ways. The, the, you want a rule that's predictive so that people know if they're going to start a business, they can continue in that business. At the same time, you wanted flexibility to say, well, geez, we have this, this, this hard and fast rule, but there are certain circumstances under which we think it's a good idea. If there's a failing newspaper even in Dothan, Alabama, where there's not a lot of big media, maybe we would like to have the, the, the television station or the radio station pump some money in, in there to save that, 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 that station. So they built in a series of potential waivers. But it had to, the presumption was that it, in the top, 20 markets that would be presumed all right, that could be countered the other way. But in order to preserve some flexibility on a case-by-case -case basis, they allowed people to come to the FCC and say, look, I'm pleading my case for you. I'm pleading what the Washington Star tried to do in 1975. Please don't let this fail. And in this sort of notion, remember, this is before the internet, before cable, before, before C-SPAN. Uh, before uh, the, the dramatic increase in the number of television stations. The idea that any one company could dominate the information flow to the American public is, is, is ludicrous. Is uh, All Britain and other broadcasting companies, so how do they look at last night? Are you overly worried about it? I, you know, for us, no. I mean, we're, we're here in Washington. We created, out of whole cloth, on our own, a 24-hour local cable news network that's consolidated and it's co-located with our broadcast station. The two of those stations combine. I mean, most uh, network-affiliated stations do, I don't know, three and a half, four hours of live news a day. That combined facility does something on the order of 18 hours of live news a day. I think everybody would agree that would be in the public interest. Then, out of whole cloth, we created... Politico and Politico.com, which within a year has become the dominant political news uh, uh, vehicle uh, in, in the country. Um, that is a newspaper. It's published three days a week, but it doesn't fall within the specific definitions of a newspaper for this rule. So we think that broadcasters are going to be able, uh, certainly in the Internet age, to come up with multiple uh, uh, websites to sort of capture the viewers and the eyeballs of the, the people are going to be, the new way people are going to be watching and reading the news. And notwithstanding the, the way that perhaps some senators or some uh, congressmen view the media in the prism and the haze and the memory of, of 30 years ago, uh, we think that, that that's, uh, we, we've, we've sort of gone beyond that. One of the issues as far as the FCC is concerned that have been making the rounds as of late when it comes to broadcasters is the issue of localism. Uh, a, a series of proposals from the FCC. Why is the FCC involved in this, and what gives them the authority and about making sure that a broadcaster like yourself makes sure has a local presence in, in the town that they're representing? Well, it's interesting the way you phrase the question. That what gives them the authority? That really is the nub of the issue. What does give them the authority? We've been regulated. Broadcasting has been regulated now for 
80 years. Uh, and in that 80 years, we've seen this pendulum swing back and forth in terms of how much content regulation there should be. Uh, in 1912, which was the first act, led to the 27 Act, which led to the 34 Act, uh, that had this notion of public interest in it. And it was the broadcaster's obligation to program in the public interest. That public interest uh, uh, language in the Act says nothing, nothing about local programming. In fact, it would be unconstitutional under the First Amendment for the FCC to say, you shall produce local programming. Uh, there's some vague language in there about how stations ought to be allocated. What the FCC did back in the, the late 1940s, uh, it's, or in the late 1920s, said we're going to choose who gets to be a licensee based upon the programming that they proposed. And if you propose programming that those commissioners particularly liked, well, then you were going to get the station. Fast forward to 1949 when the staff of the FCC said, we think that that good programming should be these 14 categories. And that then morphed into 1960, about 50 years ago, the height of programming requirements where there were certain um, uh, ascertainment requirements. You had to know and go through these, these tremendously bureaucratic hoops to figure out what it is that the local community wanted and then programming accordingly. Fast forward then 25 years into the early 1980s and the commission sat back and said, wait a minute, this is not working. This is collapsing under its own weight. There's no evidence whatsoever that a local broadcaster isn't going to pr uh, uh, produce programming that appeals to its local constituency because that's how they make money. The public's interest defines the public interest. And so we had this pendulum that swung back the other way that said, no, we are not going to out of out of concern for no statutory authority, but fundamentally for the First Amendment that we're not going to require broadcasters to program any specific way. Now the pendulum, 25 years later, comes back the other way. And if you read this localism report combined with uh, another uh, 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 document that the FCC approved a, a couple of months ago that requires broadcasters to delineate on a quarterly basis, program by program by program, and, and fit into these made-up categories from the FCC what it is that they're programming. If you read those two together, the FCC has really gone back to 1960. I feel like Rip Van Winkle sometimes. Why I, do you think that is? Well, I think the commission, uh, as a matter of politics, is listening to uh, the constituency. People are saying, we don't think. And it was primarily driven by radio, I think, more than television. But we, the, there is a num number of vocal minorities that said, we don't think that we're getting the programming we deserve. But when the commission puts out this localism report, it can't even define what localism is. I mean, let me ask you a question. If we determine that, I don't know, uh, teenage pregnancy is an issue in our local community, big issue, could be an issue in multiple communities around the country. But let's suppose that that's an issue in our local community. Why is it any better that that issue is uh, addressed via local news or local programming or on the Oprah Winfrey show? Does it matter where that comes from? Does it matter that it comes out of Chicago as opposed to uh, uh, Reno, Nevada? or Washington, D.C. I would argue it doesn't matter. And if that's an interest, and if the broadcaster knows that it needs to serve those interests, it's going to program that issue either locally or nationally or, or, or for, for, through syndicated programs. Can you give us a look? You were at the FCC, correct? Three times, actually. Uh, and you dealt with issues of deregulation, if I recall. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a scenario, then, what happened during your phase there as far as the ability for the FCC to say, wait a minute, give the broadcasters a little more flexibility in how they want to program, and the current conditions today? I know you mentioned politics of the situation. Do you mean politics on Capitol Hill, politics within the commission itself? I think both big P and small p politics were at issue. In 1981, when President Reagan was elected, he was elected under the sort of broad banner that we're going to do something to take a look at regulations that no longer serve the country. Uh, Mark Fowler was appointed as chairman of the FCC, and he set out five objectives. Among those objectives were that we were going to look 
through the prism of the First Amendment at every single broadcast regulation that there, that there is. Not just broadcast, but every FCC regulation that there is. And if it doesn't stand, withstand the scrutiny through a First Amendment test, then we're going to look to change it. And that's exactly what happened. We said at the time that these rules uh, were more form over substance. When a broadcaster had to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to go to ascertain the community, go to individual leaders of the community, and then go uh, have a random phone survey and be subject to petitions to deny that, oh, gee, it wasn't random enough, or you didn't talk to this agriculture leader, and we don't think that agricultural leader was as good as this agricultural leader. And the petitions became um, more about the form, less about the substance. Broadcasters knew very well what their, their markets wanted. And lo and behold, in the last 25 years since deregulation, guess what? They're still addressing local interests, uh, local I issues of, of public interest, notwithstanding the fact that we don't have ascertainment. Now the commission wants us to come back with ascertainment. They have uh, these 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 suggestions that we move uh, to pre-1981 regulations on where you can even locate your studio, which is just ludicrous. Because it would be required within a city of license. Well, here's a funny story. Um, our station here in Washington is located a couple of hundred yards from the, the district line, right on the other side of the Potomac River. We're closer to the FCC than any of the other um, uh, stations in the, in the market. Uh, we can see the FCC from our, from our windows, uh, yet we would have to, under this new plan, uh, we'd have to um, break our lease find new lease. We have 350 people at this, this television station. We'd have to relocate over to a couple of hundred yards into the district. To what end? The commission itself requires us to put our public uh, file on the internet so no one uh, ha has indicated to us that they have had a difficult time getting to our station. And more fundamentally, but for a quirk of, 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 of the law in 1847 when they gave that portion of of uh, the district back to Virginia, we'd be in the heart of the District of Columbia. So I, we don't think it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, there's no hue and cry for this. But it's that mindset that says, well, geez, we have to control these broadcasters. They don't have a federal newspaper commission. There's no federal internet commission. There's no cable uh, programming requirements. Nothing that says to you here at C-SPAN that you have to do this programming. This is just uh, rules, programming rules, for over-the-air broadcasters. And remember, 90% of all viewing today isn't even over the air. It's via cable or satellite. And so we're talking about rules that affect just broadcasters for this 10% of the country. You said mindset. Take that to the point that this is an FCC under a Republican administration. And does that change anything? Well, this is an FCC under a Republican administration. Well, is it, is it, is it because you had talked about the 80s when the period of deregulation was going on, and now we're current day with the Republican administration when you have more rules being imposed? Yeah, we can't figure that out. We, we don't understand it. The broadcasting industry doesn't understand it. Certainly when, uh, Commissioner, uh, when Chairman Powell uh, in the first Bush administration uh, put forth some, some, some efforts to try to consolidate and, uh, and, and uh, in some, some way rationalize these multiple ownership rules. Uh, he came up with a plan. It was a, a, a colossal effort to try to, to integrate all of the, the aspects of the multiple ownership rules. Um, uh, as I say, it was taken to the courts in the Third Circuit, decided, no, we don't like that, so they have to do it all over again. And uh, here, uh, uh, Chairman Martin has tried uh, done a yeoman's job in trying to just at least modify them slightly, uh, and he's uh, run into this uh, this roadblock. One of the things currently underway, uh, digital television transition. How are your stations dealing with it? Well, most of the stations is doing fine, uh, although it's cost us a lot of money, and it's going to create some angst uh, come February next year when uh, when you turn on your your uh, your. Uh, television set in your kitchen that might not be hooked up to cable that you still get over the air uh, that geez I, I, I didn't get that coupon and I don't have that converter box so my television go isn't going to work anymore remember that's only with respect to over the air those people that get uh, their television through cable uh, or through um, uh, through satellite 
it's not going to affect at all. They're not even going to know what happened. But for that 10% of the country that still gets their signals over the air, and for those viewers, you may have cable or FiOS or something in your home, um, but not all of your cable or not all of your television set might be hooked up. And so you're going to need some converter box so you can get this, this new way of, of getting television. Um, now, you said money. Was this because of the, the, the equipment involved, or is this because of education, or what do you mean? I, I'll tell you, uh, this whole process of changing, essentially from 30,000 feet, changing the way television is distributed over the air, that's what this is about. The commission said, uh, the, the government said, look, you're not using this spectrum very efficiently. We want this spectrum back. And when we get it back, we're going to auction it off. We're going to mm -hmm. make a lot of money, and it's going to be good for public safety and good for uh, wireless, and it's going to be great. But we need, to get, we need to get that spectrum back. So broadcasters, we're going to move you to a different channel, and you're going to do it in a digital way because we can pack more in there. It's more efficient. So that's what this is all about. Well, for moving from this channel to this channel without causing great, great problems, there was a slow transition where broadcasters for a time were forced to operate on both the analog and the digital channel, and that's been very expensive. We, for example, just recently at our station in Little Rock, Arkansas, were making changes to our tower to accommodate the, the, uh, the new digital facility, and we had this gigantic 2,000-foot tower, very impressive vertically, not so impressive horizontally, because it fell down, and that's millions of dollars that we're spending uh, and broadcasters uh, spending to operate these two channels. Finally, in February, we're going to be giving uh, back uh, one of those channels. We're going to be going digitally. I think we're, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Broadcasters have been uh, undertaking an enormous effort to uh, educate the population. I think you'll find a lot of uh, regulators. I think you'll find a lot of congressmen very nervous because if people can't get their television, who are they going to blame? They're going to point their figures, fingers at the government and say, you did this. And I'm so you'll hear a lot of, of angst from uh, regulators saying, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough because they want it to go smoothly. I think it is going to go smoothly. Certainly for 90% of the country, it will, be, it will be no problem at all. But for that other 10% broadcasters, I think you'll see, you see them on the air now. Uh, you see these, these um, uh, uh, public service announcements, commercials. You see crawls. People are going to know what they have to do. All you have to do is, uh, is get a converter, and the government's helping you do it. They're giving you two coupons per household, $40 a piece. I just got mine myself. I've, I, I went out and picked up the, the coupons, and I got the, the converter boxes because not all the sets in my house are, are connected. So are all your local television stations locally doing stories or inform informationals Absolutely. on these kind of and things? And it's a requirement from the, 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 the commission. We actually, uh, through the National Association of Broadcasters, went to the FCC and said, here's the commitment that we're going to, uh, 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 going to undertake. Uh, uh, thousands and thousands of, of imp hundreds of thousands, millions of impressions we are going to, to um, uh, uh, commit to stories, to PSAs, and so forth, um, uh, uh, speakers bureaus, uh, an enormous effort to educate the public. Well, we've got a few minutes left. Can we talk about the future of broadcasting? Because you mentioned it yourself as we convert to more of a digital format. You see shows moving to the Internet. You see the ability to watch television on a lot of different platforms. What does it mean for a local network affiliate like yourself? I think we're going to be fine because we have this commitment, this local commitment to the news. Uh, we have something that nobody else has. We have the infrastructure and the expertise to provide that programming. Through the use of these new digital channels, we're going to have digital sub-channels. Here in Washington, for example, we have a, a unique all-weather station, but we have a very unique local um, uh, a digital subchannel called Local Point, which is local artists, local bands, local comedians, local everything, local uh, filmmakers, uh, and we're experimenting with the use of these digital subchannels to bring new new forms of programming that is local. Certainly, I think you'll see news as a as a vehicle. But then you'll find broadcasters adapting to the new media platforms as well. You see broadcasters today doing things like Politico.com or l doing things on their websites uh, and multiple websites per station to, get, to, to, to gather niche programmers. Certainly uh, the efforts to do things like our 24-hour cable news channel on the cable side 
our efforts in or, uh, efforts to use our expertise to bring in those viewers and they're going to view different ways they're going to be viewing through small clips on your website i think we we're well positioned to adapt to those those new uh those new uh, platforms in in including uh, platforms for pdas the fact that you can have a uh, a device like this with a little screen and through some efforts from the uh, the um, uh, National Association of Broadcasters and through uh, some other coalitions of broadcasters to actually transmit uh, those pictures to these these mobile devices sort of what broadcasting used to be broadcasting over the air to everybody so I think we're going to adapt quite well so you talked about the vehicle to bring them in but what does it mean for advertising because as more people move away from tradition and that's what broadcasting depends on commercials and, and advertising I don't think anyone has ever invented a better way to aggregate mass audiences than broadcasters and I think advertisers rec uh, recognize that uh, they find different ways now because we can now parse through uh, particular uh, demographics to say geez this is a slice that this advertiser wants so maybe we slice it this way on our website maybe we have a uh, separate programming just for a younger demo maybe we have this news demo we're going to adapt quite well and I think the advertisers uh, uh, in, in the country of say, are becoming uh, obviously much more sophisticated and, and demanding this slice and I think broadcasters are still going to be able to gr uh, to grab the very large um, uh, platform that, that that mass advertisers need but we'll be able to slice and dice it in in smaller increments as well one more quick policy question uh, we'll come to a presidential election this year chances are changes at the FCC what will that new commission have to deal with and specifically in terms of broadcasters what do you see down the horizon that things that are gonna have to be considered well the very first thing that they're gonna have to face uh, after the election is February of 2009 the election will be in in November of this year and uh, in February of 2009, there's going to be this DTV conversion. So uh, technically, there's going to be some fallouts. They have to deal with things like low power transition, these low power stations that will transition to digital. So there'll be some continuing low power work. And then there's going to be some efforts, my guess, to relook at some of these, these localism rules or some of the ownership rules. Um, but I suspect that by and large there's not going to be a massive change in the way broadcasting is regulated. Jerry Fritz is the Vice President for Legal and Strategic Affairs for Albright Communications. Thanks for being on the